Hey everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, brothers, sisters, friends, enemies, frenemies. It's Brother Rob Wilson. I'm pre-recording tonight's Bible study on Ephesians chapter 4. We're only going to do, uh, we're not going to do the entire chapter because what happens in chapter 4 is we go into a much, much weightier um, and much more uh, deep text with great implications. Not that everything wasn't um, a, had great effectiveness and implication to the text, but chapter four is basically a linchpin. What is called a linchpin, and it can it doesn't just connect to chapter three and chapters five and six, but it is the beginning of going into a great deal of depth. And that is all based on chapters one through three. So we're going to do a little bit of a review in this um, before we get into chapter four. Or as we get into chapter four, then we're going to go back and review some of the depths of chapter one, two, and three. We're also going to talk about the the theme of unity in the spirit. Amen. There's a lot of people who are bringing up the topic about being having unity in the spirit. We don't need unity in theology and we don't need unity in denomination, but we're going to take a biblical dive into what that looks like. Let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word and we thank you for everyone, every brother and sister who tunes in, every brother, sister, and even unbeliever or seeker who tunes in. We pray that the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart would be acceptable in thy sight and that these would draw others to you and to seeking the spirit of truth and righteousness and the gospel of Jesus Christ, which leads to eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's go right into the um, chapter four, and I'll put bring this all together. So chapter four is, su you know, subheading on chapter four is unity in the body of Christ. And this is where the, the very first verse begins, I therefore, I therefore, and we have to ask ourselves, what is the therefore, therefore? And the therefore is not just what precedes um, chapter four in the previous paragraph. Chapters one, two, and three are critical factors to where Paul goes in the rest of the book of Ephesians, okay? All of what preceded this, all of what preceded this must be delved into and comprehended in its depths to get the grasp of what Paul is saying now. OK, so let's just go um, for a little bit. Let's just go back to chapter one and review some key points. OK, just some key points. And I usually look at key points as ones that I decided to highlight in green uh, above all other texts. It's all deep. It's all, it's all valuable. It's all nourishing to our soul. But in verse three, Paul begins, <clears throat> blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ Jesus with every spiritual blessing to, to plumb the depths of the spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus that we have now. Okay. Present tense blessing, okay, it is a deep dive. I mean, it, it is a whole three or four other uh, hour-long videos minimum. The blessings that we presently have in Christ Jesus. For example, the blessings of the Holy Spirit, the blessings that the fruit of the Spirit abides us in, in Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, joy, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, this meekness and temperance against such there is no law. Okay. We have that present tense. We're not to be looking forward to have that in some future time frame uh, when we go to be with the Lord. It says has blessed us. And it says in heavenly places, which tells us that we have what I've talked about before many times. We have to be looking to Christ. We have to be fixing our eyes on things above, setting our mind on things above and not on earthly things. If all our mindset and all of our everything we're looking to all the time is is apart from the word of God, it's apart from the kingdom of heaven, then we are not going to experience the blessing of hope because it comes from 
above, and it comes from Christ. And it says, in heavenly places, even as he has he has chose us. Look, here we here we go to another deep thing that's gonna bless us. Look at all the us's and look at all the things that says what God has accomplished. Not we have what we have to do, but what he has done. That's the focus of the first three chapters. What he has done, what he has given, how we have been blessed. And he chose us in him. You know, and I, when I went over this chapter, I talked about those of us who have felt left out or have felt rejected or have felt overlooked, but not in Christ, not in the family of God, beloved. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Isn't that amazing? That, that our election was from God, from before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, amen, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. Look at that. He has blessed us. He has predestined us. He chose us. Oh, this is so deep. But this is what the therefore in chapter four is connected to all of these nuggets of truth in the first three chapters. It talks about we have in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and on earth. In him, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined. There the word again is predestined according to the purpose of him who does what? And this is why we rest in him, why we trust in him. This is why we don't become unnerved and easily, uh, you know, easily um, moved by circumstances of earth changing as they are, because we have these blessings in him. And it says in him, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. All things that seemingly are good, and seemingly maybe not so good because it doesn't say God works good things together for our good. He says he works all things together for our for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. It doesn't say all things are good, even horrific things, even terrible things, traumatic things that have happened in our life. If we surrender that to him, if we submit to God, resist the devil because the devil wants us to become identified with the trauma and not with the resurrection of Christ, not with the glory of God. But God can take the depths of disaster and despair and tragedy and turmoil and turn it around for a testimony. Amen. And he works all things according to the counsel of his will so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory, that he gets the praise, not us. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantor of of our inheritance. I don't know if I'm all the way up here until we acquire, uh, until we acquire the possession of it to the praise of his glory. Now he goes on here about praying the Thanksgiving and prayer. And he prays. One of the things he prays is that the, having the eyes of our hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he was called, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might. And it goes on to say the working of his great might that he worked in Christ, that same power that raised Christ from the dead works in us when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. This does not sound like this is all good news. There's all 
kinds of power and encouragement and hope and reasons to persevere in everything we hear in the first chapter. And who is it about? It's all about what Christ has accomplished and what God did for us. Now we go on to chapter two <laughs> again. It talks here about us being having been dead in the transgressions and sins in which we once walked following the prince of the power of the air. And we once walked as sons of disobedience at one time following the passions of the flesh and carrying out its desires. Verse four, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. And when did he love us with that great love? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, the godly for the ungodly. He who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5.21, he who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It says, um, rich in his mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive. He made us alive. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We should be living in this world from a whole different perspective. Although in the world, we're not of the world because this is not our home. If you have truly been regenerate, okay, if you have truly received the Holy Spirit, I believe that you will have a whole different grasp on, and a whole different viewpoint on this world. And it says in verse eight, it says, for by grace, you have been saved through faith. This is an excellent reminder that it, and it says here, let me read it, not a result of works so that no one may boast, you know, so that no one can get the big head over someone else so that no one can feel like they have received anything um, uh, greater or lesser than someone else. It doesn't matter from the person who was essentially moral. And yet still a sinner. In other words, you didn't sin all that much. You was as much of need of this grace as the most radical, desperate prostitute or the the individual who Bernie made off, who swindled people out of eight hundred million billion dollars, or you know, Adolf Hitler, Jeffrey Dahmer, okay? That that moral person who was basically you know, maybe built, born with a silver spoon in their mouth, okay, never did anything. You need the same grace as everyone else. It takes the same amount of grace to save you as it took to save them. That's where we get in a problem. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Um, he goes on. 14, he is our peace. And this is going to become important right now. Take a mark on this. Uh, chapter 2, verse 14. For, and it's talking of Christ. For he himself is our peace. He is our peace. He is called among all the other attributes of Christ, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Who has made us both one and has, and this is the Jew and the Gentile, because formerly the Jews were excluded from the promises of the patriarchy. Okay. And he's talking about the coming together of Jew and Gentile. He has made both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments and expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. Okay, we we have been, you know, through our belief and faith in the gospel, we have come to a peace tre treaty with God. The wrath of God does not abide on his children. The wrath of God, like it says in, earlier in chapter two, the wrath of God was upon us. We were children of wrath by nature. The wrath of God was propitiated, was paid for, was atoned for by the blood of Jesus and we're covered by the blood of Jesus. We're at peace with God. We're not at hostility with God. We have been made right with God. We have been justified by our faith. We have been given the righteousness of Christ through faith. 
But it says here that Jew and Gentile, there was a separating and dividing wall of hostility between them. And he has, he has abolished that law of commandments expressed in ordinance that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. People who think this is only an expression of something that happens horizontally, vertically, if you look at this verse, you can't deny that the Jew and the Gentile, you know, are at peace with one another. Jews can no longer exclude Gentiles because they've been brought in in the new covenant in Christ. So there is reconciliation horizontally as well as vertically. You know, even as I say all the time, you know, welcome to the live stream, brothers, sisters, friends, enemies, and frenemies. I mean, when I call someone else an enemy, that doesn't mean that I have hostility or desire to do them harm or hurt. Okay. Maybe, maybe hurt because hurt is sometimes necessary in discipline and correction and rebuke. Okay. It might hurt. I mean, some of the best things that ever happened in my life have hurt. Okay. But they weren't for the purpose of harm. Amen. So, <clears throat> We have peace. We can have peace with our enemies. You know, we can be aware that we have an enemy in in their heart, but not not in my heart, not in my heart. We may be on different sides of the fence, uh, doctrinally. You you could be a false teacher. I don't hate you. I my my heart is to ask you, you know, and you know, cr you know, uh, exhort you to repent and to turn from what you are saying and what you are doing in the name of the Lord to teaching sound doctrine, which accords with Bible. Okay. And frenemies, there's some people that, you know, they're, they're clapping and they're applauding and they're smiling in my face and behind my back, they are not for me. <laughs> they are with me, but they're not for me. And that doesn't mean I'm not for them. Okay. Because, we all going to have a situation where we have some fake friends. Lest I digress. He wanted to create one new man in place of the two. Okay. So that Jew and Gentile would have the same. Afforded the same things in Christ. And might reconcile to us. Reconcile us both to God in one body. Through the cross. Can I get an amen? Through the cross. We are both reconciled in one body through the cross. Thereby killing hostility so you can have um a peace which <laughs> we often know this type of peace and it's a it's a false peace it's a it's not really a peace it's not really a death of hostility it's just a ceasefire do you know what i mean wait a minute <laughs> do you know what i mean i gotta have a sound effect here Oh, yeah, I haven't had any sound effects. Do you know what I mean? You can you can say, okay, well, let's just drop it. But a week later, two weeks later, either you or that person is going to bring it up again. It's 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 a ceasefire. It's not a cessation of the war. It's just we're not talking about this till I get some strength back in me. That's not the kind of peace that we have in Christ. We have an obliteration. Of all hostility towards us from God. We have a, 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 a an obliteration of all the wrath that was deserved by us due to our trespasses and sins. And we have a, a killing of the hostility between us and God. And the cross, if we apply it properly and we have forgiven in, uh, properly, may not mean the the restoration of a horizontal relationship with someone else okay because they continue the hostility so we need to set a boundary but we in our heart <laughs> as it says in the scripture we forgive from a heart we're not over there lobbing you know atom bombs over in their direction okay we still love we still have the capacity to love them we have the capacity to pray for them. We have the capacity to ha take pity and have empathy for where they are, maybe in their condition of bitterness and hostility towards us, in their 
unforgiveness towards us, maybe for for an actual or perceived injustice that we've done. You know, some people get mad at you and hold grudges against you because you wouldn't put up with the abuse they were giving you, <laughs> a.k.a. the narcissist. All right. They do. You know it. You know it. So, I've, had, I've had lots of people that had a grudge against me for the abuse I wouldn't take from them. We've probably all been there before. So let's go on um, that he might, you know, reconcile both of us in, uh, to God in one body uh, through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. We got reconciliation here. We got grace. We got uh, salvation through grace. We got every spiritual blessing. Um, then let's go down to chapter three. Paul talks about this, what Christ accomplished on Calvary. He calls it the mystery of the gospel revealed. In the Old Testament, Christ concealed nuances and hints and clues and prophetic language that people didn't grasp. What is this plan? What is this seed? Okay, from, from through you know what what is the seed through which all nations will be blessed? Paul says it's revealed in Christ Jesus. It wasn't before known. Um, and he was made a minister of the gospel according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to him by the working of his power, the Holy Spirit. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So see what I'm saying here? All of this is going to come, come down to something in chapter 4. And to bring the light, bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Okay. Mystery revealed in Christ. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access. Woo! With confidence through our faith in him. Whoosh! That's a whoosh moment. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you. It is your glory. And then his prayer that we could all, you, you know, relate to this prayer. And this prayer is, is, is to realize this prayer, like I said before, is to realize deliverance. I mean, to, to, to really receive this revelation that Paul prays for us to receive would be healing us. It would be healing. You know that we know that, the, that that there's healing in the cross of Calvary, but the implications of the cross when they sink in, and when we get it, that when it gets down deep in our mind, and we take root in our heart, in our spirit. You know, the things which we have suffered, the injustice of the world, the the just the atmosphere of being in earth at this time in our, he's a praying for spiritual strength, but the source of that strength, the source of that strength, again, it is not in this world. What do you say? He has given us every spiritual blessing where, because we have to realize this. Some people are asking why they're running out of strength, why they're running out of power. Why am I running out of hope? Why am I so depressed? Because you're still trying to gain things that, you know, that give you victory or give you hope or bring you joy from the very place that robs you of joy, which is the atmosphere of this world, you know, and you're not going to Christ. You're not looking to Christ. You're not uh, going to the word of God to pluck these treasures, which <laughs> Ephesians chapter six, I mean, really, you could write six, 10,000 page volumes of information about these six chapters in the book of Ephesians. If I was to only be able to have two books in two books of the Bible, I think I would want the gospel of John and the book of Ephesians. And I think, you know, if, if you were given only two different documents that you could hold on to. And I think I could, I could make something, I could make a lot happen. <laughs> you know, God can work with those two, these two books so, 
so powerfully. But he says in this prayer, he says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. See, we have to get this deep depth, not superficial knowledge, not not something that went in one ear and out the other. We have to meditate on the things of God. We have to meditate on the books of God. It says that in Psalms 1, blessed, blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked or stands in the way of sinners or sits in the seat of the scoffer, but he uh, meditates on the, he delights in the law of the Lord and on it he meditates day and night, okay? So we have to get this. And, and he prays that we would be strengthened with this, with, through the spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you <clears throat> being rooted and grounded in love may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints. And this is the life changing part that wipes away everything someone said, everything someone did, where someone left you, where someone rejected you, when it didn't work out, when they didn't call you back, when they didn't text you back, when they were supposed to show up and they didn't. Okay, watch this. You may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ, to know that love, <laughs> it makes your best friend pale by comparison and it lowers the expectations. You know, the, one of the most depressing things in life can be sometimes unrealistic expectations. Expectations of people to be a God to us that they are unqualified unable, often unwilling, and even if they were willing to try to be your God, your source of strength and hope, your source of joy, your source of perseverance, even if they tried to be all those things to you, they can't. They cannot be what only God can be. Nobody can be God but God. But to know he says, with what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ. That surpasses knowledge. So you can read the book. You can. You can read the book and not get it. But I mean to tell you, when you can comprehend the love of Christ, you have to keep looking at the cross. You have to keep looking at the sacrifice of Christ, the sacrifice of God, that he would pay something so high, so priceless, so holy, so blameless, would lay down his life for, for me? I mean, if you have a right view of you and you have a right view of him, you don't say, well, yeah, great, thanks, thanks, Jesus. No, you're like, for me? For me, it's bad enough that you say, okay, he did it for us, but you got to come to this place where it sinks in. Lord, Jesus, you did this for me. I'm aware you did this for others, but I can understand maybe others, but you would do it for me. Because hmm. he is wanting, this is written to individuals need to read this. Individuals need to understand this. You can write a letter to a church that every individual needs to, to apply. <clears throat> and he says, it surpasses knowledge. And this is a revelation we get. This is a revelation we, if it hasn't, if the love of Christ has not had full effect on you, pray for a revelation of the love of Christ. Paul says it has height. Paul says it has breadth or width. Paul says it has length. So when it says height, it, 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 there's a deepness to it. There's there's a weightiness to this. Have you ever had somebody give you a hug around the shoulder and say, love you, brother, love you, sister? 
and you and before you can tell them something good that happened in your life, they're gone. They're on to hugging the next brother or sister. It's a superficiality of love, you know, that sometimes we get very cozy with, you know, but it still feels that awkward sense of I'm not really vibing that you love me in the way that I comprehend love. Just say, just tell me you like me, Peter. <laughs> just tell me you like, tell me you phileo me. Okay. You don't agape me. You don't, you don't arrows me. Thank the Lord. You don't storge me. Eh, I'm, I'm, I like you, you know, but this love of Christ is not like that. <laughs> this love of Christ is agape love, unwarranted, unmerited, undeserved, indiscriminatory, okay, impartial. <clears throat> okay, we're, we're back. So in, in light of all of these things, this is in verse, in chapter four, the therefore is in light of everything that chapters one through three cover. And I know I didn't cover every detail. I just hit the highlights. So we're back at chapter four in light of everything previously said. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. You can search far and wide in the scriptures, and we don't find a place where it says Christ. We know Elijah ran. We know Elijah was a hard charger. But in every way, that we see Christ operating in the world. He was walking. He wasn't even swimming because he could walk on water. Remember, we don't have any implication of Christ running or jogging from town to town. And we, and yet we have a, a, a so many references in the scripture to being called to walk in a manner worthy or walk um, fitting in a fitting way. And a walk seems to, um, you know, a the term walk seems to refer to intentionality and also a, a, a manner of trust, that there's a certain manner of trust that w when we walk and we're not sprinting or running or jogging, you know, walking is a relaxed practice. It's a step-by-step -step practice. Okay. Walking in a worthy manner is step-by-step. -step. It's not rushed. It's not hurried. On a walk, you can have a conversation. In walks, we should have conversations with others, but in walks, in a walk, a worthy walk, we're having continual conversation with Christ. We're, have, we're able to observe what's going, you know, when you're rushing, you don't observe situations and circumstances around you. You don't, you don't, there's a lot of things you don't stop to smell the roses when you're rushed. I think a worthy walk is something to shoot for. A, a worthy manner of walking is something to pray for. Because we have a calling to walk. We have a calling to follow a Christ, a Savior, a Messiah who walked. I know this may seem like this is something, this is something spiritual. He walked. So if we're following, how can we follow him if we're running and sprinting ahead of him? Because we're called to follow Christ. We are get so busy. We get so hurried. We get so rushed. We overlook so many, so many opportunities, so many opportunities overlooked in a rush. And if you're rushed, that's not a worthy manner to walk in. Um, but he says this, this walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Okay. It's a walk, not a sprint, not a race. You, you, you know, uh, progress beats um, speed. It's, a, it's, a, it's an endurance race. We're called to persevere. You don't persevere in 100-yard dashes. You don't persevere in 50-yard dashes. You sprint, okay? 
that's not what this is. You know, trying to get something too soon, trying to be, you know, all that Christ will make you and getting frustrated with your lack of progress. That's not a worthy walk either. Because what did it say? Or, uh, what does Paul say? And I think it's Philippians. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will or the want to and to do of his good pleasure. Think about that. Something's getting worked out of you, but you want to work it out in three steps and God's going to work it out in 500 steps. Okay. Think about steps, steps. I think it's um, Psalm 37. This is the steps of a righteous man. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And he delighteth in his way. Let God order your steps. And he orders our steps in worthy walks. Okay. And it goes on to say, with all humility and gentleness, with patience. And humility means meekness, submissiveness. Okay. Suppleness, easily correctable. Humility is an easily correctable person. Gentleness, okay, being gentle with one another, but also being gentle with yourself, being gentle with how this whole thing will work out. There's a lot of people doing a lot of yelling and hooping and hollering and cast out a demon and signs and wonders. You know what I'm saying? They they get on the hype. I don't I don't I don't see in scripture Christ acting like that. In fact, isn't there a scripture that says Ah, let me think of how it's written. Behold, my servant in whom I delight. Um, I'm not getting this perfect, but it says he will not quarrel or cry out. And, it's, and his voice will not be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering candle he will not snuff out until he brings justice to the nations, I believe it says. That's that's a walk of humility. Uh, and gentleness. That's a walk of patience. Bearing with one another in love. Mm. That's a, you know, I just see this worthy walk of our calling. And it it talks about humility and it talks about gentleness and patience. Bearing with one another in love. Let me just say that it just seems like all of this, okay, is is a matter and this has happened having to do with unity in the body of Christ this is, has to do with our relational um transactions with each other and I don't mean transactional relationships but I mean in our interactions with one another you know just for example you know when some someone recently was just doggedly you know like uh, resilient on a doctrine that they have misunderstood they were they were dramatically defending it and I'm, this is this is just me i was like hey you know if i'm wrong hey i want you to i want to know i'm wrong i, I want to know the truth so hey i'm gonna I, all i'm doing is listen you explain to me from the scriptures how you you know how you get arrive at that position i'll, I'll be right there with you and then from the scriptures the individual had no answers for the dogged, false, per, false interpretation of the doctrine that they were trying to use. And look, I didn't have to tell him he was wrong. The fact that you don't have any evidence, the fact that you have no biblical reference, the fact that you have no examples, you know, it speaks for itself. And that, that also has to do with being gentle in correction and patient because another thing that I have never done this, but you know, I've done this with certain people, you know, my wife included will say, Hey, let's, let's table this right now. Let's, let's set this aside. Let's, let's just let this go and come back to this tomorrow or come back to this in one week. But I recently heard someone give a testimony of um, something they disagreed with someone on and they, they agreed to table it for a year and come back and talk about it a year later, pray about it, 
seek the Lord. And it didn't even take a month before one person prayed and sought the Lord and came back to the other and said, you know, I see it. <laughs> I see it the way you said it. You know, that's unity in the body of Christ. That is let your reasonableness be known to all. I think that's also in Philippians. Being reasonable with one another. Maybe, maybe there is a possibility of that. There's some things that we have. I'm going to get into that here in a minute. Bearing with one another in love. Okay. Um, and it says, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Now I'm back. I went, I went back to chapter two, verse 14. Look, this is where I want to point this out. For he himself, this is Christ, is our peace. That's our bond of peace. Christ is our bond of peace. The gospel of our salvation is a bond of peace between legitimate and genuine brothers and sisters in the faith of Christ. So I'm going to be flipping around here now. Um, but as it says here, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, since the word of God itself says Christ Jesus is our peace. He's the Prince of Peace, and he is the peacemaker between God and man, you know, the reconciler between God and man. Since it says eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, this is why doctrine is of the utmost critical aspect, because the Bible says that there are other spirits and there are other Jesuses with which we cannot have peace. Now, let me take a move to another chapter. Let me go to Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, I believe. Okay, so here we go. I went to Matthew. This is the words of Christ in red. Not peace, but a sword. And verse uh, chapter 10, verse 34 do not think, this is Jesus speaking, do not think I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter-in-law against her mother, and a daughter, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Ooh. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. It doesn't sound like that's um, unity, okay? It sounds like it's supremacy. Christ wants supremacy in the life of every believer. And if we love mother or father more than him, we're not worthy of him. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And whoever finds his life will lose it. Okay. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. He says, if you really want life, really want to find life, lose your life for my sake. But let's go on and see why doctrine matters so much and why we, we have to make sure if we want this unity, we are following the genuine Jesus, okay? If you even hear that, many people are like, many Christians, maybe people who are, you know, le legitimate Christians, you read that, and they're like, I, I don't I don't believe that Jesus. I don't, I don't recognize that Jesus. I want the other Jesus. Look, you don't know Jesus. You don't know him fully. You don't comprehend him, okay? If you can't accept this, because this means he wants supremacy, and superiority over every other relationship. And in fact, doing so makes every other relationship right. Okay. Because you don't, like I said, you don't have the expectations on people they can't meet or fulfill. You don't have the demands on their love that only Christ can fulfill. You know, you don't have an appetite for their words of affirmation. You have an appetite for the word of God. People are going around like, well, how come you seem like you're able to? Because <laughs> I've got the validation from heaven. That's what that's what the Holy Spirit is, the validation from heaven. Mm, 
Thank you, Jesus. Let's go on to see what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. So let's go on. Um, like I said, this is 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. And let's see what Paul, you know, Paul wrote Ephesians. Paul wrote the book to, to Ephesus. Um, but he also wrote the book to Corinth. And these aren't contradicting one another. He says, I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me, for I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. And there were a lot of false teachers in and around many of the churches, but especially Corinth. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. There are, our thoughts are so easily led astray. They, they can be even led astray into, you know, um, <clears throat> focusing on signs and wonders and miracles and casting out demons and instead of Christ. They, they can be led astray from from. And what he's going to talk about here, and he goes on to say, um, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And one other, I don't remember if it's King James Version, it says that you will be led astray from the simplicity of following Christ. You know, <clears throat> I mean, there's people I applaud for all these biblical terms they know that I don't know. I don't know the definition of that word. I don't know the definition of that word. Uh, you know, I don't know as much church history. I know some, but I don't know it as in depth as other people. They just make me marvel at the things they know. <laughs> but one thing I do know, <laughs> but what I do know is Jesus Christ and him crucified, you know, I can recognize Christ when he comes in the room. I can recognize a person who has been with the Lord. I can recognize a person who realized they were saved by grace. They were saved by grace. Grace keeps you humble. Knowing that there's nothing that you did. Nothing I warrant. There's nothing. Nothing plus nothing equals nothing. There was nothing I had to bring to this equation except my sin and my death and my failure. You know, I didn't bring anything that could benefit God. God is, I'm only a beneficiary of Christ, not him of me. <laughs> Who I'm telling you. And when somebody has like really got the gospel, they walk in a room different. They walk in a room with a cool, calm confidence. They walk in a room with so much confidence they can sit in the back. And be invisible. And they can be there just to listen. They don't have to crowd up to the microphone. One thing I always say that I tell people, the one way I know that you're unqualified for the microphone is if you were willing to fight to get it. If you were willing to snatch it out of someone else's hand to get it, that's the evidence that you shouldn't have it. <sighs> but yeah, like I said, and I, I look up to them. I'm not putting anybody down for their superior knowledge, but... There's so many ways that we could get distracted from the pure and simplistic devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and proclaims, look what this is what I was getting at, another Jesus than the one we proclaim. There are other Jesuses. Okay. There are, and the Jesus that person is maybe speaking of, you can tell who that Jesus is by how they act, not just what they say. Don't just listen to what they say. Listen to how they act. You know, I've said something before recently that so many people are confusing um, confidence and strength with arrogance and haughtiness. It's like you can't you can't comprehend arrogance. You can't, you don't know what, it, you can't comprehend narcissism. <laughs> that person isn't confident. They're narcissistic, you know. Um, there are other Jesuses, he says, um, than the one we proclaim. Or have you received a different spirit? 
Okay, like for example, Mormons, the Jesus they talk of is not the Jesus of the scriptures. The Jesus they talk of is the spiritual sibling of Lucifer, born from <clears throat> heavenly father and heavenly mother. Okay, um, it says here there's a different spirit. Again, somebody could say all the Bible terms, but in their voice you could tell the harshness, the cruelty, the <clears throat> impatience they have. I mean, just their their bearing. You know, um, they don't they don't deal with the they don't even sometimes interact with the parishioners. They're just out there being a mega church pastor. And they have a clique of people that they actually associate with in the leadership. They have nothing to do with the congregation. That's a different spirit. Because the good shepherd wants a relationship with the sheep. But you receive a different spirit. And again, we're talking about the spirit. We're talking about evidence of the spirit, like the fruit of the spirit. Galatians 5.22, love, peace, joy, long-suffering, gentleness, faithfulness, meekness, temperance. Against such, there's no law. Okay. <clears throat> that should be evident. The, the fruit of the spirit is truth. Okay. Jesus calls in the gospel of John, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, that there's some type of inner comforting working in us through Christ and through the Holy Spirit, because the spirit is called the comforter. <clears throat> From the one you receive, different spirit than the one you receive, if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted there's all kinds of that you put up with it readily enough indeed i consider that i am not in the least inferior to these super apostles or false apostles even if i am unskilled in speaking i am not so in knowledge indeed in every way we have made this plain to you in all things but let's go on um Let's go on reading this anyway. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached God, God's gospel to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. You know, I did everything for free. I did not rob you. I didn't sin against you. I went out of my way to make sure I demanded nothing of you, but was giving everything to you. I was feeding you. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. I'm not going to have any expectations upon you. As the truth of Christ is in me, this, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you. God knows I do. <laughs> That's why I said last week, you know, when what is love? Sometimes people, can, what is actually love, people call hate. And what is hateful, people call love. Just like it says in Isaiah 520, woe to you who call good evil and evil good. But look what he says here. Verse 12, and what I am doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. Paul was saying, you talking about a different Jesus, you are operating in a different spirit, and you are preaching another gospel. We are not the same. We are not doing the same thing. We're not coming from the same place. We don't do this from the same motives. Motives, methods, manners matter. That's where we have unity. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Now let me go back to chapter four and then I'll wrap this up in James. Okay, this is the this is the least I've ever covered because this is deep, 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 deep. Okay. Paul again, I therefore, based on everything in chapters one through three, the whole weight of the first part of the book 
it takes the whole weight of chapters one through three to weigh in on chapter four alone. But this is a linchpin that ties all those three chapters together in what is being spoken of right here. So he says that we should have humility, gentleness, patience, and bear with one another in love. But that love and this unity, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, this we must be aware that every spirit is not of God. First John chapter four says, Beloved, believeth not every spirit, but test the spirits if they are of God. Marcus Rogers, a notorious false teacher, is big on unity, 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 while he attacks legitimate ministers of God, while he talks about God told me this and God told me that, I had a dream, Trump prophecies, all the like. That's a different spirit. That's a lying spirit. That's a false spirit. Okay? And there's many more besides that. There's also a huge push right now for ecumenism. For a coming together, not just a Christian coming together, but a coming together of religions. The uh, Catholic Church was part of the um, uh, Abrahamic Accords, where the religions of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity are all occupying the same house of worship in Jerusalem, okay, for peace between parties that there cannot be peace now it doesn't mean there cannot be love it doesn't mean that we wouldn't be called to show christian hospitality and love even to them but we can't affirm them and there's a huge call for that to take place there's a huge call to unite with them okay there's a huge movement among nar false new new apostolic reformation people to to unite with the Catholic Church for preaching the gospel, but it's a different gospel. It's a totally different gospel. It's it's not a gospel, as Paul says, so it's the Galatians. It's not a gospel. <laughs> it's a it's a pseudo false gospel. So in this eagerness to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, which is Christ, again, it has to be. The biblical Jesus. There's people who want a Santa Claus, four leaf clover, lucky rabbit's foot Christianity where Jesus just comes along and gives everything to everybody and loves everybody and everybody has the same, you know, people who don't believe have the same relationship with God as those who do believe. That's not Bible. That's not coming the right way. That's excluding the gospel. Uh, but it goes on to say, look, there's one body. There is one universal body of Christ and one spirit. Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. And so what I'm saying is this is true among those of us who, who are born again, be it Methodist, uh, Presbyterian, um, uh, uh, what, what do you call it? Lutheran or uh, all the denominations. I don't hey, have even words. All the denominations that are of one spirit and of one, one in the same Jesus. Okay. Have, have the same bond of peace in the same Jesus. Okay. To us, to the universal body, there's one body. Okay. And there is one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord. Okay. You got people who are saying, Lord, Lord. And if you said, could you describe your Lord? Okay. And they go and they give you a litmus rundown of all the things. Huh. Oh, that, Lord, that Lord's not my Lord. You know, that's, that's not the same Lord. One faith. Okay. Now there are many faiths. There are people who claim Christianity, they're Christians, but they're not of the same faith. They're not of the one faith. One baptism. One baptism. The baptism that comes from God. One God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure 
of Christ's gift. Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. I'm going to end it right there. So we only went through the first eight verses. <clears throat> and this this unity and oneness and this unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. I'm all for that. I have this unity with Baptists, Pentecostals, Lutherans, um, Wesleyans, this, that, everything. You know, I don't care what denomination they belong to. If they have the same Jesus, the same gospel, and of the same spirit. And that spirit is the spirit of truth. So we're not going to have unity with progressive Christianity that's saying things that what God's word says, contradicting what God's word says for the sake of changing times. No, you know, he's the same yesterday, to do, today, and forevermore. Now, let me go and show you in James chapter 3 what we're dealing with in people who disturb unity. Okay, and, and I want to remind you, there is a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 where it talks about divisions in the church and it talks about how people you know one says i follow cephas and one says i follow apollos one says i follow paul and one says i follow christ is christ divided and what it talks about in james chapter 3 verse beginning at verse 13 is 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 harmonious with ephesians chapter 4 and it's harmonious with first corinthians chapter in the first chapter where it talks about the, the way the people perceive themselves as followers of those who are merely servants of Christ, rather than looking beyond the servant that ministers to you, looking beyond the person who's, who's preaching on Sunday or who's doing a YouTube video on some teaching and stuff, and looking to Christ, and also looking to the Word, looking to the Bible, being Acts 17 Berean Christians who who eagerly searched the scriptures to see what, if Paul was saying was true, you know, eagerly searched the scriptures. We, you know, this, this, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, you know, to discern whether that person is a false teacher or not. You, you listen to what they're saying. Listen to verse they're, they're quoting, pause the video. Okay. Then read the whole context before it. Sometimes they're just twisting the, that very thing itself. And that's obvious. But sometimes if you read the context before it and after it, you find out, mm, no, you really messed that one up, boo. You really twisted that to make it say what you want to say. Be a Berean. But let's just go um, in the in the beginning of chapter three. It was talking about the tongue, you know, being tamed and one tongue, um, you know, can salt water and fresh water come out of the same mouth. Uh, so let's just. Um, James chapter three, verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. I gotta get us a bit of drink here <clears throat> in the meekness of wisdom. But if no, so the meekness of wisdom goes back to Ephesians chapter four, when it talks about walking in a manner worthy. And then it says in all humility. Um, so it says here that we're to, we're to, uh, conduct ourselves in meekness of wisdom you know don't be overly wise don't let your wisdom uh, try to elevate you above someone else but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts do not boast and be false to the truth okay i had to take a break get a drink of water but let's go back to verse 11 it says well let's go back to verse 13 who who is wise and understanding among you by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, and look at this key word right here. Many of the people who talk about demons the most are very competitive, are very jealous of each other, are very ambitious to get more subscribers or more people at their 
deliverance conferences and paying for their de deliverance training here. And it says here that if you have bitter jealousy, selfish ambition in your hearts, it's not something to brag about or be false to, you know, be honest with yourself. And it says here, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual and demonic. Okay. That is strong language and it is the truth. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder. And it says here, every vile practice. That is, again, every vile practice. There'll be covetousness. There'll be malice. There'll be strife. There'll be division. We're not to be competitors. We're not in competition with each other. No matter how big or small you are, Every person has value in what they're doing for the kingdom. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to butt somebody else out of the way to get your moment in the light because God gives to each one of us what he sees we are able to handle and worthy of. In verse 17, this is the linchpin right here. But the wisdom from above is first pure then peaceable, gentle, and look at this. This is this is huge. Like I said, in, it says in Philippians, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. We should be known as reasonable people. Open to reason. Open to correction. Open to, I don't see, I, help me see what you see. Help me see what you're saying. Can you? I've even put it out there for the demon slayers. You know, if you want to take me through the Bible and show me how Jesus saying to Peter, get thou behind me, Satan, is meaning that there's a demon in him. Show me that from scripture. Show me that. <laughs> show me that. Make a believer out of me because the scripture should be able to validate that. It's not what that scripture is saying. What Jesus was saying is that in any way you contradict the plan of God, you're being satanic you're in your flesh it doesn't mean satan has entered you doesn't mean a demon is working through you no it just means you're you you're your carnal fleshly unregenerate un you know you don't understand his ways are not your ways and his thoughts are not your thoughts you don't get him <laughs> peter that's what it was saying it wasn't saying that a demon was in but if you could show me how that works at all. I'm open to hearing and listening. That's being reasonable. But there's no way. There's no way to reason that from the scriptures. None. I've tried it. <clears throat> but it says it's full of mercy. This is wisdom from above. Full of mercy and good fruits. Not calling people gummy bear Christians. Because they're not jumping on my bandwagon. Impartial and sincere. That's wisdom. Wisdom shows impartiality and sincerity. And it reaps a harvest of righteousness. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And how do we make peace? What's the great peacemaker? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Preaching the gospel. Preaching Christ and him crucified. It makes peace between God and men. And the work of the cross is a peacemaker between man and man. Even your enemy, even the one who hates you because of Christ in you, you don't have to hate him back. As a matter of fact, we're called not to hate him back, but to love them, to pray for them. We're called in the Bible. Many times people can fall way off course because the Bible says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Hey, look, I know this has been a long one, but and it's we've only went through um, verses four through eight in Ephesians chapter four, but it's it's getting deeper. And so the next few videos will probably be only over um, one to eight verses because of the depth and the interconnections that are made in all the things that Paul's about to say in four five and six actually so all right everyone thanks for tuning in to this segment of the 
study of the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Please post a comment in the comments. Let me know what you think of this breakdown. Let me know any scripture verses that came up in your mind and in your thoughts as you follow along. And again, follow Christ in grace, peace, and love. And let that grace, peace, and love that comes from the Father through Jesus Christ fill your hearts richly. Amen.